and my children wouldn't be like, did dad make it home? Because we'd heard stories of friends getting hit. And, um, you know, it, it just, it makes you a little more cautious. So I moved indoors to do um, 80% of my training. So all of my endurance training is done indoors. So when you say zone two, I can do zone two indoors all the time because width makes it easy. So as we're going, if you have burning questions, uh, feel free to interrupt and I'll do the best I can to answer them. So let's advance the slide. And we're, we're just going to talk about what it is you need to get rolling. Um, there we go. So bare minimum to get started, you need a heart rate strap. I'm wearing a Wahoo um, ticker, which is what you see there. And by the way, if you are a Wahoo ticker user, the strap will break multiple times. And then you'll send a note and they'll send you a new strap. They'll send a note, they'll send a new strap. And then eventually you'll say, these straps don't work. And you will go buy a replacement strap for a Garmin. They fit perfectly and they never break. So go with the Garmin strap after you've broke your Wahoo kick or ticker strap. If you're gonna need a bicycle. This is a uh, Monodone. I tend to train indoors on the same bike I race outdoors on. Uh, the sizing's right, it feels right. You wanna get the results indoors that you're gonna get outdoors. And then you need a smart trainer. So what you see here is a Wahoo kicker. Uh, the Wahoo Kicker is the device I've used since I started in 2015. And the one that I bought in 2015 still works. But I recently saw a deal on a Saris H3 for 300 bucks, brand new. So I had to buy that too. So now I have two smart trainers. So if you're a friend and you want to come ride at my house with me, I have two trainers. But that is the bare minimum of what you need. Bike, heart rate. And a, uh, and a smart trainer. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. What it's going to take is um, your credit card to get started. Uh, and it, you're going you're gonna to want to do your sign up, not from the Zwift application. And you're not going to want to do it from your phone on the iPad or, or the phone. Um, you're going to want to go to a web browser. You're going to type in Zwift.com. You're going to say, I want to set up an account. And it's going to take your basics, and you need to have a credit card ready. You'll get seven days for free as a trial, and you can cancel it if you want. In some circumstances, people run link connections, and they'll give you up to 14 days with some partnerships. But um, you're going you're gonna to find that it's very useful and easy. So, um, you know, after seven days, you'll be ready to go and they will be ready to take your money. Um, so the platforms, if you have a PC, whatever brand you like, if you have a Macintosh, uh, Apple TV, an iPhone, an iPad, an Android, all of those can run Swift. And with those platforms, um, you want to make sure that you're using devices that have Bluetooth. And if you don't have Bluetooth, you can use what's called Ant Plus. I've never done that before. If you live in 2022, you should have Bluetooth. So go upgrade your computer and, um, and improve your life a little bit on that one. Uh, but you can do it with Ant, Ant Plus if you need to go another way. So uh, we go from there into getting um, the, the app launched and there's a login. So what you're going to need to do here is um, you're going to need to know your login and password. And when you, when you hit this, go ahead and advance one. Once you've um, gotten yourself logged in and anytime you go back, it's going to have your name. So you're going to be easily able to go in. And what does it say? Uh, 42,000 miles. Was it more than that? I thought it was 60. Yeah, I don't know. Might have been more. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, but uh, anyhow, let's let's go ahead and go forward one more. 
pairing the devices. And this is um, what you're going to see when you get to this page is that you've got four different categories. You've got your heart rate, which when you when you see it, it's probably going to be blank because you've never been here before. When you click on the heart rate, uh, your heart rate monitor, which Wahoo Tickers one, Gar Garmin has uh, Bluetooth, and there's others out there you can use. When you click it, that'll be an option, and you just click on the, the Wahoo, and it'll, it'll start showing your heart rate. Uh, your power source uh, will be the next device. And typically, if you're training and you have a coach, your coach says you got to have a power meter. So you probably have a power meter on your bike. My bike has a stages power meter, which is a, a crank um, power meter. Uh, you could have pedal based power meters. But if you click on power source, you'll have the option for the Wahoo kicker, which you can select. You'll have the option for your, your crank based power. You could select that as well. But what we want to do is make sure that your smart trainer is connected. So choose, start off by choosing the Wahoo kicker. And then after you've done that, go over to where it says controllable. And when you click on the controllable, select the Wahoo kicker. And then where it says cadence, if you, uh, if you have an older Wahoo kicker, it doesn't read the cadence. If you have the latest and the greatest, it does provide the cadence for you. Uh, but if you have the older one, just um, default to your um, crank-based power meter or your pedal-based power meter, because that will provide cadence as well. And then after you've done that, now this is the, if you have a coach, they're going to say, we want light numbers. When you're out on the road, we're going to see what kind of power output you're having um, based on, you know, whatever your crank-based power meter is. And if I use Zwift as my power source, there's going to be some margin, some difference there. And um, the numbers are going to be a little different. Your coach is going to be like, oh, you were indoors, I see. Oh, you were outdoors. The way you get past that is if your coach says use your the same power meter in, indoors as you use outdoors, go back to power source, click the stages, or click uh, your quark, or whatever it is you have. And then that's what your power will show. And then when you apply force, it's going to be the same thing you see on your Garmin or your Wahoo when you're riding outdoors. So that's how I train, because when I have a coach looking at my numbers, I want them to see like for like, because I'm doing the same training indoors as I'm doing outdoors. So, um, so that, that hopefully gives you enough to get started there. And as you have problems connecting, if you, if you can't find your power meter and you're like, why can't I find my power meter? Or why can't I find this or that? Oftentimes, it's because it's connected to some other device, Bluetooth-wise. So if your crank-based power meter is connected to your um, Stages app, it's already taken. So you're not going to be able to get it via Zwift. So, so if you can't find it and you're like, why won't it show? That's why. So disconnect your Bluetooth from whatever device it's connected to, and then it's out there in the wild, and Zwift will be able to see it. Okay, so once your system is um, all set, the, uh, the thing you're going to want to do, and, and the reason I put this up is, you're going to want to have things because you're going to be sweating, it's going to be hot, and you're going to want to have everything you need to, um, to get rolling. I, um, I put a picture of my friend, Sean McAfee. He lives in Texas. Uh, he, he races with an indoor team that I ride with and, uh, he's got a cool indoor setup and he goes to a lot of trouble to get it just right. So, um, you might buy one of these little triangular things that catches sweat. Uh, you're going to want a water bottle. You're probably going to want some nutrition. When I ride in the mornings, most mornings I do anywhere from an hour and a half to two and a half hours, depending on what, what the day is. So you need to be eating because practicing cycling, 
you're going to find that being a good cyclist is great, but being a great cyclist is somebody who knows how to manage nutrition. And if you're wondering what this tab is, that's Super Sapiens, which is a glucose monitor. And that's what I use as a fuel gauge to tell me how I'm doing on nutrition. I'm not a dia diabetic, but um, I have lots of friends who are. And anyone who races an endurance event needs to eat like a diabetic because your body's going through all the same things. Uh, this isn't available in the U.S. yet. It's still in a trial, but, um, but I highly recommend nutrition. Get EFS or something to put in your bottle, which has carbs. Make sure you have food nearby. Um, training that is, is critical. Um, also a fan. Make sure you have a fan because it's going to get hot and you're going to sweat like crazy. Find some sort of a table to put in front of you. I'm a musician, so I have a music stand um, available. It works really well for me. I can put my iPad here, I can put my phone here, and I'm good to go. So, um, so that works really well. Um, beyond that, I think, uh, let's see, earbuds. We, we, uh, we like to have music. You can connect your Bluetooth earbuds to your TV and watch the news while you're riding at 5 a.m. with me. Um, and I'm on there, so connect with me. My name online is Pete Butler. And if you find me on Zwift, it just says Pete. So um, you can find me. And um, also have a towel because you're going to be sweating and you're going to want to mop your brow and whatnot. And trust me, your bike gets a lot of corrosion. You're going to sweat like crazy indoors. And right here around your brakes and around your, your crank and your bottom bracket, uh, you're going to sweat like crazy. And when you take it to the shop, they're going to be like, what have you been doing? This is nasty. I have a friend in Ohio. His name is Matt Yankow. He leads one of the most popular rides in uh on Swift, and it's uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's called Kiss at Base. There's four groups. It starts at 5.50 a.m., and it'll go probably until, it's anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours and 15 minutes on determined by the day. But this guy is a sweat machine, and when he goes to the bike shop, he can hear them say, oh, no, it's the sweat guy. <laughs> so I can promise you, you will be the sweat guy or girl um, if you start swifting, and that's a good thing. So, so, so yeah, don't be afraid of that. Uh, let's go ahead another slide. Okay, you um, you're at the let's go uh, mode. This is what the new uh, screen looks like for accessing the game, and it was confusing when they launched it. I don't know a couple months back, but um, we've kind of learned our way around. You can you can go into just a free ride, which is, I think, down at the bottom of your selections, where you can go to any world that's open at the time. Uh, you can do a training plan. You could do a uh, ride with a pace partner. Pace partners are cool, by the way. If you haven't joined a group before, a pace partner ride would involve um, you joining a group and it will um, put you with what's it looks like a translucent cyclist and they hold a pace that never ever changes and when you choose a pace marker you choose the one that you you feel like uh you know you you can hold the wheel of or that it's going to work for you that day for an endurance ride it's a good choice for endurance rides uh, but you're going to need to learn how to do some metric system stuff uh, sorry americans but the, the cycling weight is measured in kilos. So if you weigh a certain weight, just go to Google and say, I weigh 135 pounds, like everyone who's watching weighs, and say 135 pounds to kilos, and it will tell you 60.7-ish, I think is what it is. Or that, divide by 2.2. Or divide by 2.2. Okay. Go to Google, people. Um, it's easier. <laughs> or listen to your coach, Brady, and divide by 2.2. Uh, you also want to put your height in. Um, height 
impacts how you perform on Zwift. Uh, you may not be as tall as me. I'm fairly tall. I'm five foot five. And uh, that, I don't think that helps me. If I was a little bit taller, it would make me faster. Um, but uh, so you want to get those right. And then once you have what your kilos are, the way that we measure pace partners is through watts per kilogram. And watts per kilogram is, you know, you got to measure how many watts you, you feel like you can put out. So if you're, you know, and if you have a coach, if you have a coach like Brady Irwin, who is a great coach, by the way, he led me to the highest of heights in cycling. Uh, won uh, a big race or two under Brady's direction. Uh, he's going to give you zones. Zone one, two, three, four, and five. Zone one is couch. That's recovery. For me, that's less than 170 watts. Um, if we go to zone two, that's going to be my endurance pace. If you can ride zone two at endurance pace for four hours, you're probably not going to get dropped down any rides. But if you follow the plan and you do what co the coach is telling you and you do the stuff that does VO2 max and you do your sprints and you do your uh, three by 10 with five minutes in between and, and sweet spot or whatever it might be, you're never going to get dropped. And that's the great thing about Zwift is it's controlled. You can test all of those things. You can hold it and measure it. But you need to know how to do these conversions. You need to know what your zones are. If you've done an FTP test, which I highly recommend, work with Brady or do the FTP test on Zwift. It will give you your range. And once you've had that, then you can break out your zones. If you don't know how to do it, send Brady a note and say, my FTP is X. And he'll say, here's how the zones break out. Now, Brady did not tell me to say this, and I may have just given him more work. But if I did, um, I, I apologize, Brady. But uh, these are things you have to know. Once you know what your zones are, and then you can you can learn how to hold them, you're going to be like unbeatable. So that's that's really important. And um, so anyways, other things you can do is um, you can pick a different route or you can join a group. Most of my rides are done in groups. I told you I do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with the Kiss It Base ride. Again, it starts at 550 Cleveland time, which is the same as Tallahassee time. I say Cleveland time because the ride leader is from Cleveland. Um, anyhow, so that's a great ride. Uh, there's lots of other groups out there that have collectives. There's groups that are uh, built on inclusivity. There's groups that are female driven rides. There's groups that are, you know, with all the, the super fastest racers, the folks are all training together. There's groups that are Canadians. There's groups that are in Asia. There's groups in Australia. Whenever you're awake, if you wake up at 3 a.m., there is a ride waiting for you. If you want to race, you can choose that as well, and you can go see how you stand. Uh, based on your FTP and your presence status and what kind of wattage you can output, it'll self-categorize you in A, B, C, or D. And if it doesn't self-categorize you, you know, pick a group that you feel like you know, you could start at. If you start in D, you'll probably be as fast as anybody and won't have any problem. C gets a little harder. B gets a little harder. A, that's where all the guys that, that are moving the fastest are going to race. Uh, let's go ahead and shift forward one more. And this is an example of a training plan. The, the reason I wanted to show this is when you choose training, if you scroll all the way to the top, so the section on the left where it says workouts, if you go to the very top, it says training peaks. Oftentimes you're working with your coach and he's giving you specific workouts and your coach puts in, you know, a graph that shows I need three by 10 after you've done a 20 minute warm up in zone two, then you go into your three by tens with five minute breaks in between. And if you choose that as your training, it, it has a graph on the bottom, and it says right in zone two, and you just sit there. And then it says counting down 10 seconds until, you're, until you start, and then it goes up, and you you got to hold that wattage or whatever it is. 
then you got your break and that's probably zone one in between try to ride it in zone two after you've recovered a little bit and then you do it again but it guides you through it the whole way and you can see here you know on this 30 by 30 second anaerobic that it shows the breakdown with the build up and and the different uh workout plan and as you're riding through whatever land you might be in it's going to it's going to tell you what to do you also see down at the bottom it says use erg mode the, this is uh, something i have a lot of strong opinions about uh a lot of people like erg mode because it's convenient what it does is it basically controls uh the uh, resistance of your trainer so that you have to you have to push a certain amount to meet whatever the workout requirement is to hit the wattage but it's the decisions are being made at the smart trainer level the reason i don't do erg mode and the reason i would argue you should not do erg mode is because this is a great training tool but you also have to train your mind you need to train your mind to sustain a certain wattage so the way you train that is you take the responsibility you make the decision that i have to hold 250 and you hold 250 and guess what it wavers you're going to be 235 you're going to be 270 and then you're going to settle in you're going to be like oh it's perfect and then it starts going uphill and you're pushing more and then it goes downhill and you're pushing less but in the end your mind is what's going to drive drive you on the road and if your intentions are to ride on the road as well then riding in erg mode you know what's going to happen and I had said this to Coach Brady on Saturday. Man, if I could just turn Earth mode on when I'm in a gravel race and I didn't have to make any decisions, if I could just sit and it made all the decisions, I'd be great. But that's just not the way it works. It's on us. So you have to hold the power. Now, all that said, what do I know? If you want to ride Earth mode, ride Earth mode. Um, but when we race, we're going to test your mind to see, uh, to see if... Uh, if you can hold it without a machine making the decision for you. Let's go ahead and flip forward one more. This is just the, the visual of your entering gameplay. I would say that the first time I saw this when I was entering Swift, it clicked on and the Z kind of fades in and it's getting ready to go. And your thought is, what am I going to experience here? What is this all about? And you're entering a very strange world. And by the way, I know the emotions of indoor cycling. And I catch a lot of grief for this. Online, my friends nag me and harass me and call me names. When I'm outside, they're always like, oh my God, I can't believe you're outside. And by the way, I am incredibly pale uh, because I just train indoors. So. You were pale before you trained indoors. I was pale my whole, yes, thank you, the audience is with me on this. I've always been pale, um, but but now people think I'm pale because I'm, I'm training indoors. Uh, the truth is, is that 80 to 90% of all of my training is indoors. Uh, and because I've ridden a bike my whole life and I've raced most of that, that you know, I haven't lost a bunch of skills because I have the muscle memory, but um, you're going to get harassed and it is a world, a world of difference in, in what we see outdoors. And when you ride indoors, there is a group of people that you will meet when you start doing the same ride over and over and over again. And you're going to create friendships. And I, I just want to take a moment to tell you how real the friendships are. During COVID, there wasn't a whole lot of choices we could make on being with groups. We were all concerned. And that was when it was like Zwift boomed because everybody moved indoors. And the way that we communicate online when we're riding on Zwift, racing on teams, is we connect to an application called Discord. I'm not going to talk much about that, but that's a, a texting tool and it's also an audio driven tool. And that's how the teams communicate. My team time trial team, we have people from Australia, Ireland, England, Canada, Indianapolis, Tallahassee, South Florida, you name it, Tampa, Mark Boltz. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, so 
we've got people everywhere, but we're, we're communicating and we're talking. And guess what? You can have better conversations on Zwift with the people you're riding with and racing with than you can in a Peloton because you only can talk to the person next to you when you're outside. On that, you got eight people racing and talking and you become really good friends. And you talk about the race, but then you talk about your families and your life. And then you talk about the impacts of the things that are causing you great difficulty. And these become really close friends. In fact, my closest friends during COVID, the people that I was riding bikes with on Zwift, um, made it through a lot of difficult moments over that last year and a half. And it was a global event. And all of us had those moments. But to have this as a pathway to relationships and friends became really important. And so important that when I went to England, not but a couple months ago, um, we were going, my wife and I, for vacation, I made a trip to Yorkshire to visit with one of my teammates, uh, Stuart Featherstone. Sounds kind of like a name you'd hear in England, right? Uh, hey, Stuart. So, but we went all the way up to Yorkshire and visited his house and his family. This is the guy I've been running around with for seven years on Zwift. He was there when my father died to offer care and kindness. Um, all of the things that happen in life, these are people that are going to become as close to you as the people that you ride in the Peloton with in Tallahassee or wherever you might be from. So you're going to find that building relationships on Zwift is going to happen just as well as it does, maybe even easier and quicker than it does on the road um, when you're out riding IRL. And if you don't know what IRL means, I'm a really old guy, but I know it means in real life. And when you say that to a younger person, they're like, oh, you're like the only person who says that anymore because they've moved on to something else. So anyhow, go ahead next to the, the next slide, if you could. Um, when you start, where do you start? What does this mean? If you're free riding and you just pick a world, I picked Watopia. Watopia, this was the original Zwift world. It drops you right here, not far from the marina, and it just leaves you sitting still until you decide to start pedaling. You start pedaling, people are zooming by you, and you just start getting rolling and you're feeling it out, and you're like, okay, so what do I do? And you know what you do? You just turn the pedals over, which uh, things will reveal themselves as they go. Um, that's your free ride. If you join a race, it drops you in a starting pen. And there's a lot of people sitting in there and visually you see you see their avatar and they're sitting on a smart trainer waiting in the pen and they're pedaling and it's like okay and then you you'll see over off to this side when you're riding there's a chat window that pops up and people are talking hey i'm from uh you know new hampshire where are you guys from hey it's raining here whatever it's a bunch of nonsense and Oftentimes, it's old friends, and we're talking. Uh, so you're, you're kind of sitting in there. You get eight different views. If you look at the bottom of the screen where you see um, the blue, the number one is view number one, which uh, puts you behind your cyclist. View number two puts you a little closer to your cyclist. View number three is you're the eyeballs. You don't see your cyclist, and it's like you're in the pack. Uh, I like that one when I race. But if I'm in a big pack when I'm racing, I like uh, number two because I can kind of see where I am in relation to the back of the pack. And if I float too far to the back, I don't want to have to drift off and then hustle to get back in the draft. Uh, so that's helpful. But when it comes time to go time, I want to be right in view number three so I can kind of see where I'm at and, and have that perspective of where I'm, I'm going. Uh, view number four is a sideways view. So... After you do your ride, it takes a picture from the ride and it posts it up with your Strava. Oh, and by the way, you can link this to Training Peaks. Peaks. You can you can link this to Garmin. You can link this to um, your Strava. And when you're done with your ride, it's just, it's going to upload it to all of those. But uh, you'll have a picture. But if you do view number four, it's a sideways view. What I recommend is wait till there's a downhill and then stop pedaling, and it puts your rider into the super tuck which, by the way, is now against the rules in uh, the UCI, but not on SWIFT. Um, but uh, UCI is the federation that oversees professional cycling, if I'm using uh, jargon, I apologize. 
But that's a good picture of you in the pack in the super tech. It looks really cool. But remember to start pedaling because when you hit the flats, the guys with the power just ride away if you're not moving. Um, so that's it. And then if you're doing a group ride, uh, it puts you in a pen and there's a countdown and then you get rolling. The nice thing about group rides is, so if you said, well, Pete said there was this thing on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday called Kiss at Base that starts at 550. If you were like, I'm not starting at 550, I would never start a ride before 6 a.m. You can late join any of the group rides for 30 minutes. So late join is super cool uh, because when you say I'm ready to join, the ride's already gone. It's off somewhere else. It puts you in the pen and then you're sitting in there alone and you're like, what happens now? You just sit there and it says finding riders, finding riders. And then all of a sudden it throws you in to the group and you're sitting right in the middle of the group with the rider that has what's called the beacon. It's got like a, a yellow logo over the top of them. And the beacon is the ride leader and he's setting the pace or she's setting the pace. And you have pedal assist for, I don't know, 10 seconds maybe. So while you're getting going, you're pedaling, you're finding your rhythm and then pedal assist is gone and you're either riding the right pace or you're falling off the back. If you're falling off the back in a group ride, say, can I get a sweep? And hopefully if you're with a nice bunch of people, somebody will drift back. In my ride, his last name is Cushman. And he'll come back and then he'll help drive you back up to the group. And whenever you're doing a group ride, I would say that the etiquette is about the same. Uh, just like if you're doing a group ride in Tallahassee, you wouldn't, if you're riding outdoors, you're, you're on uh, Moccasin Gap Road and you're with a group and everybody's doing a, a good pace and then all of a sudden you like right off the front. If it's not a simulated race, like, you know, everybody's agreed that we're doing a race, that's poor etiquette. Instead, we ride together, we rotate together. If you're in a group, you ride together. Uh, they have ways to, to manage that, but if you fall off the back of the group and you need help, you say, hey, I need help. If you don't say you need help, they'll often say, do you need help? And you can say, no, no, I'm quitting. I'm done. Or yes, please come help me. So, um, so you'll find that that's, that's good. And if you do your training plan, it, it will, I forget how you pick the world you're going to be in, but it doesn't matter because you're following a prescribed, uh, power out output. So, you know, just, you know, I'm not sure where it's going to put you. I, hopefully it would be like Tempest Fugit, which is flat. Um, I like that course. Uh, that's where I like to do my uh, prescribed training. So let's go forward. Uh, there's lots of worlds. The first one was Watopia. Uh, you can see there's lots of places you can go. France, Paris, New York, London. McCurry Islands is uh, some fictional land that appears to be uh, a place where the lights are never on. It's always really dark and uh, there seems to be an Asian vibe because all the buildings have, um, you know, Asian writing on the side. And if it sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about, I really don't. But it's dark and it feels like you're in another country and it's not real. Yorkshire will put you on uh, a lot of options, but you can also ride what was the World Championship course at some point, which is not recommended. It's really hard and it's hilly and there's a lot of climbing. And if you do a race there, it could hurt. Um, Innsbruck. Uh, great courses there, a lot of climbs. Richmond, that was another place where there was a world championship, really good. Down in the left-hand corner on the bottom, they only uh, show you three worlds that you can go to at a time. That may have changed, but they don't offer all of those worlds. It, it's got a rotating schedule. There's a site online called Zwift Insider that puts up each month a calendar that shows exactly what the worlds will be. So if you go to ZwiftInsider.com, you can find that calendar. Uh, you can also see that um, I show a picture where it says finding riders. That's where you're joining a group ride and you're waiting to get thrown into the bunch. Um, pedal assist when you get in the bunch. It's, uh, it's pretty cool once you get going. And the other thing that's really nice is Zwift has a built-in help desk. It's called Every Rider Around You. Everybody had to start somewhere. Now, to be in the level 50 plus 
we're the guys that have been there forever and uh, have been grinding it. And if anyone asks a question, uh, you're going to get you're going to get answers. What are those things called power ups? What is that? Uh, why don't you go forward the screen for me? Uh, I'm going to get to that in a second. But if you're if you're in the main screen when you're riding, uh, in the upper left hand corner, you'll see a little circle button that is called a power up. Um, yeah, go back a, a couple more. Let's see if we can find one in a. Yeah, right here. So you see this up where you see the truck uh, in the upper left hand corner. That um, that would be enhanced draft. Uh, there's another thing that looks like an eagle kind of logo that's screaming. Uh, that's your your short sprint burst um, power up. There's a. Uh, there's also a feather, so if you're going uphill, it makes you lighter for a, a brief amount of time. Uh, when you're wondering, hey, what do these do? How, how long do they last? Just, just ask the people in the ride that you're on, and they'll, they'll tell you all sorts of stuff. But when you click it, it it's uh, got like a clock, and it's just counting down around that circle at the, the speed. But, um, you know, the way it's laid out, you're going you're gonna to see a lot of stuff and a lot of numbers, and you're going to ask a lot of questions, and folks are going to be able to provide you a lot of information. Zwift Companion, that's something that you're going to want to run on your phone with your PC, your Mac, your Apple TV, your iPad. But this is... When you're, when you're doing the ride, if you launch the app, it's going to look like this. This is going to be where you get to communicate with, um, with the other racers and riders. It's where you're going to text. You're going to be able to see the layout of the course. You're also going to get to sign up for rides. So it's the night before you know, you're planning to ride the next day at 9 a.m. and you're like, what ride can I do? You can go in and Scroll down to where it says activities, click on the thing at the top that says tomorrow. When you go in there, you'll see a list of all the rides. Some will be races, uh, some will be group rides. Uh, there's a variety of options there. Pick the one around the time that makes the most sense. If you can't find something you like, then I recommend you pick a pace partner. Or do whatever your coach sent you in the training plan and follow that. Uh, I will say that I wish I did that more often. You're going to find things about this ride that are just the things you like to do. And you're going to get off on your own thing. And your coach is going to be like, why aren't you doing the training plans? Why well, was it? I had a race. I was, I was doing a race. And uh, at least you're riding your bike. But when you're training for a specific event or your coach is trying to help you get somewhere, you know, you want to follow the plan. But you're going to find yourself choosing all sorts of options. Uh, the, uh, so the events tab is where you're going to go to find those events. Activities is you're going to be able to see activities that other people are doing. Um, the, one of the cooler features is at the top, you see that little thumbs up. Uh, giving people encouragement as you ride is, is you know, part of the whole community. Anytime you open that app, if you click it, everyone that you're friends with will get a thumbs up. So if they're riding. If they're not riding, they don't get a thumbs up. But um, I, use, I, I I've never logged on to this app and not had friends riding, and that's because I've been here so long that I have well over a thousand connected friends. So I'm always going to get somebody. The next screen that I show over from left to right, the second one, that is your personal information, and it shows you know details about yourself, how much you've ridden, how many hours. Yada yada yada. What level you're at, and um, and that's uh, if you needed to change your name because you're racing on a team time trial team, and you needed to say, "Oh, I'm riding with you know this team." You typically put that in parentheses, so you'd click on the edit in the right where you see the little pencil. It looks just like every app you've ever touched, and it brings up an edit screen. You click on your name. After you put in parentheses, you know, that you're racing on the Dirt Diggler team, which is the one I race on. Uh, no lie. <laughs> and then 
The next screen is when you look for um, events, this shows you information. Oh, I'm doing stage one of a race. It shows you the course, it's one lap. If you see a race course, like this as a uh, McCurry Island, I think it is. When you click that, you're like, okay, what can we learn about McCurry Island? Is it hilly, is it flat? If you go to Google Swift and then the name of the course, you will get all of the course information. It'll show you the profile. It'll say it's flat or there's like a 20 minute climb. If you're a climber, that's great. If you're not, I don't recommend it because uh, there's going to be a bunch of guys that can really hit it. But that way you can go in knowing what you're going to face. Um, and as whether you're riding indoors or outdoors, entering a race where you don't know what the profile of the course is, um, is not recommended. There's enough information and enough GP, you know, GPX files that you could download outdoors. You're never going to be on a course where you can't get the information. Same thing here. So if you're doing a training ride, it's like, oh, I have to hold a specific wattage or I want to hold a specific wattage. If you got to hold a long effort, well, maybe you want to climb Alp Duez and hey, that's going to take you anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and 45 minutes, depending on your level. Um, unless you're like super fast and you probably do it in 30 minutes, but there's not many who can do that. And then you can also find your friends on the right. Um, it's an option to just find Swifters that you know. I searched somebody local that I actually race with on the team time trial team. His name's Darian. And um, you can go there, you can click his name, and then you can uh, send him a note or if you're not friends, you can click and connect with him and then you can follow him and that sort of thing. So the Swift companion is critical because if you were trying to text within your group uh, during a Swift ride, you'd have to do it from the app and it just, you're clicking a lot of buttons and it can get kind of messy. So I don't recommend that. Let's go ahead and move forward. After you've gotten in Swift and you're making progress and you're doing all the things you love, um, you want to set up an environment that you're going to show up to every day. Um, you're, you want to hang up stuff uh, Febreze because you're going to you're going to stink the joint up. You're probably going to want a mat underneath it to help you know keep you in place, but also to kind of absorb some of the sweat when it hits the ground. Um, you're going to want a nice TV. You might want some speakers, um, but you want to personalize it. And I have seen some amazing pain caves with black lights underneath the platform that they're on, and it's rad. But make it a place that you want to go to. There's going to be days where you're, you can't wait to ride. There's going to be other days where you're like, I'd rather sit on the couch. Well, guess what? Zone one is sitting on the couch. I recommend that you never watch TV unless you're on top of the bicycle. Earn it and pretend that you're powering the TV. So if you're going to watch the news every morning, watch it on your bike while you're riding on Swift. It's a beautiful thing. It's great. And uh, your body's going to thank you. Your clothes are going to fit better. And your friends are going to ask, what are you doing? Why are you so energized when you come to work? Because I wake up at 4.30, so I can be on my bike at 5, and I ride from 5 to 7.30, and then I come here, and I'm charged up. And that's why I fall asleep at my desk at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> but forget that part. Let's go ahead. One more. Uh, oh, well, I just threw this up here. When, uh, when Zwift first started, you had to sign on to uh, request an opportunity to be uh, in the beta. And... When you got your, okay, you're in the beta, you were all real excited. It was like, oh, cool, I'm in the beta. This was March 2015. They had first opened up the beta in the fourth quarter of 2014. And when I got on, it was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I just know that I need to try to figure it out. And it, it wasn't easy because then we were all the pioneers and trying to make sense of things. And, you know, the beauty now is, you don't, you don't have to be the pioneer. There are pioneers in your midst. There are experts in your midst that can tell you exactly how to do everything you want to do. Um, if you go forward one more, you'll see that my contact information's up here, petebutler at gmail.com. That's really easy. You can find me on Twitter. 
but the best way to reach me is petebutler at gmail.com. Send me a note and say, hey, can you help me with this? What was that ride you talked about? Hey, you said you knew how to do this or that. Um, just just holler and I'll, I'll you know, help you along. And, uh, and if, uh, if you have questions about what are my zones, that's where you reach out to Science of Speed and say, help me figure out what my zones are. It doesn't seem like they're right. They're too easy. I feel like I, I should be, my zone two starts at 290. And, you know, then they'll work with you to get that right. And as you um, ride indoors, you're going to find that there's ways to get more power. And it starts with getting a bike fit. My power output, because the way that I was sitting on my bike, um, went up by 20 watts after I got done with a bike fit that Science of Speed can do for you. Also, some things that you will learn indoors that are harder to learn outdoors. Because when you're outdoors in a group, you're worried about, you know, bumping elbows, potholes, going off the road. Oh, I've got a turn. Oh, there's gravel. It's time to bunny hop an armadillo. There's all these things that focusing on your pedal stroke, learning what it is to pedal in circles. How do I get my power output consistent? How do I do that whole thing that, you know, we read about Greg Lamont scraping gum off the bottom of your foot, just like we're doing here. That's where, that's the part of, it's, everyone's pushing down, your body does that naturally, it's how do I pull back up? You're going to learn how to do that, but you're also going to find the lever, which you could ride outside your whole life and never find the lever, because you never find the way to really get your legs to activate. This will boost your glutes, <laughs> and that's where it's at, so that you can put out more power and have better results. And I didn't start doing really well in endurance ride with sustained power until I was riding on Swift. But I would also say this, the person that buys a, a bike that costs several thousand dollars, a power meter, smart trainer, all the gear, all the things you need, heart rate, a nice fan, look at this Wahoo fan, those things, you know, all, you buy all this stuff and you're like, why am I not improving? You need a coach. Invest in a coach as well. Most of my success didn't happen until I had a coach. I was out there riding and doing the best I could. I thought I knew what I was doing, but you know what I was doing? I was self-coaching, and I was just doing the things that came easy. When I visited with my coach the first time, Brady Irwin, he said, what are you good at? I said, sprinting. He said, great. And what about time trials? I hate time trials. I have no interest in time trials. I don't even want to train for time trials because I'm not going to do a time trial. He said, okay, well, when we're done, you're going to be a great time trialist. Guess what? I can time trial now, and I do fairly well at it. So uh, he was right. Having a third-party view, looking at you, seeing what your weaknesses are and building those up are going to make you a better cyclist. So if you're a good sprinter now, You'll be a great sprinter later, but you'll be a great sprinter because you're going to have built the endurance so you're there at the end of the race so you can win it. And you know what? A great sprinter that's racing for 14th or 15th place, it's great to win a field sprint, but it's not near as good as making the break and winning the sprint from the group that's uh, made the selection. So let me pause there. If there's any questions, fire away. And if not, Call it a One question is when you're joining a group, people have found that even though it says it's 2.5 to 2.8 watts per kilo or whatever it may be, they're finding that they're working well above that. What do you recommend for them at that point? Because to keep them from getting frustrated more than anything and to continue on with Swift. So it's, it's interesting when you're in Swift. So the question was, if you join a group that's 2.5 to 2.8 watts per kilogram, that fits perfectly in the range. It should be no problem because your coach said, this is your zone two endurance. What happens in Zwift is you're in a pack and you have all these avatars around you. And by the way, there's real people connected to those. Those are real people. They're not just avatars. 
but you're sitting, except for the one that looks translucent, which is Coco Cadence or uh, Bowie Brevet, you name it. But in Zwift, there is a dynamic in the, in the group called a washing machine effect. You pedal your constant amount, and it's cycling you toward the front, and then it's cycling you toward the back. And it's cycling you toward the front, it's cycling you toward the back. The reason that you're going more than 2.5 to 2.8 is because when you're going backwards, mentally you're going, oh no, and you start outputting more power because you think, oh my gosh, I'm going backwards, I'm going to get dropped. And you output more power, and then you move back to the front, and then it starts to drift back, and then you fight it again. If you settle in and trust the washing machine. Now, the best way to visually see this washing machine is if you get into view number one. So at the bottom of the screen, there's eight views you could be in. So at the bottom of the screen, it's in blue and it says number one, number two, number three, all the way up. Number one gives you a, a pretty, I don't know, it looks like maybe five links behind you kind of view on the bike. Yeah, there you go, right there. So. You're sitting behind the cyclist, but it gives you the ability to see the back of the peloton when you're drifting back. And then you see, oh, look, I'm going back up. So what I do is something called feathering the pedal. Don't output more power. Output the power that you need to output and be paying attention to that. And feathering the pedal means that you're, you're working it so that you can apply more force as necessary. The only time you should find yourself like having to work against that washing machine effect is when you're going uphill. And that's when, if you lock in, you're fine. Now, if you're with a pace partner, the way that the pace partners are set up, if it's scheduled to be 2.5 to 2.8, they actually go up to like 2.9, 3.0 when they're going uphill. So you're going to hold a more constant pace and the washing machine is not really as uh, visible to you. But the reason it's harder is because mentally you're thinking you're about to get dropped, so you're working harder. So trust the washing machine effect and trust that the Peloton is just going to float you right back through. Is that helpful? Yep, that answer. Cool. Um, other question is, for people that don't have or, or can't afford a smart trainer, is there a way for them to still do Zwift without a smart trainer? Yes. So... You're not going to be able to compete um, if, if, you're, if your like, end goal is to race. You're going to need to have a smart trainer that can calibrate. If you just want to ride, if you have what a lot of old school folks might have called rollers, um, you could do it on rollers because it's all being measured by your power output. If all you have is a power meter on your bike and rollers or a dumb trainer, which is the, the wheel goes on and it spins around and um, you know, it's got, you know, like a belt on it. And, you know, you're doing that whole deal. Um, it's measuring off your power meter that's, that you have on your bike, so cork or whatever. If you don't have a power meter, then you're going to have a lot of difficulty. Um, so you want, you want to have a power meter at least, but you can do it on a dumb trainer. So again, rollers, uh, the wheel on dumb trainer, and, and you're going to be fine. So that means you can start training and doing stuff. And also, if you're a runner, uh, there's, there's uh, smart treadmills out there, and Zwift is designed for runners as well. I have never run on Zwift. I have rarely run in the real world. There have been a few times that a dog has chased me, and I, I've gotten away. But I've been caught a few times as well. So running is not my thing. But if you want to be a runner and on Swift and you have a smart treadmill, you can do that too. Uh, if you don't have a smart treadmill, I think there's a device you can put on your shoe that also measures it. I think there's one company called Stride and there's some others and it's really cool. And the thing that I liked about Stride and I was like, oh, I might become a runner is they do an algorithm that shows power output. So I was like, oh, power. I like data. I could do that. But, but then I, I woke up and I went, that sounds dumb. I'm not going to run. So I didn't do that. Uh, but yeah. I, so yeah, dumb trainers, rollers, you can be on Swift. 
but don't enter a race because you'll see everybody saying, oh, that guy's on Z power, Z power. You know what that means? That means that you're not using a, a smart trainer. Speaking of Z power, I'm going to, I'll tell you the question that would be asked. Hey, when everybody's racing, where do the, all the numbers get calculated? How do I see the results? How do I see where my ranking is? I heard that people, you know, are trying to be the number one Swift cyclist, like uh, Jay Brun or Holden Camo or Matt Gardner or any of those guys. Um, Freddie Ovet, he's pretty fast too. Um, it's called ZwiftPower.com. It was originally built by a third party to build um, a mechanism for seeing who you're racing with before the races, what their ranking is. You can see what their strengths are. Are they sprinters? Are they breakaway guys? And it would become the way that you prepared to go against the competition. ZwiftPower.com. You'd have to register there, sync it up with your um, Zwift account. Zwift acquired Zwift Power, and that is now built into Zwift, but you still have to go to Zwift Power and register with your Zwift account, and you can get all of that information. But in the end, you want to know where you stack up. You want to see, if I looked at all of the, okay, so my age group is 55 to 59. I want to see where I rank 50 to 55 to, or 50 to 59. For all the riders in the U.S., where's my ranking? Boom. Um, so you can see how many A's are in that, how many B's, how many C's. So, yeah, we're all crazy about data. We like our Strava. We like, we like our numbers, and we like training peaks, and our coaches want to make sure that, that you know, we're producing the numbers we need to, and if we get stale and stagnant, we're going to get questions about it. But, um, you know, data's, data's our friend. And it's your data, so so leverage it and get better. So yeah. Okay. That's Any all. other questions? That's all of them. Thank you all for joining. I hope that you have a great evening. And if you have any questions on Swift, I'm your guy. If you have any questions on training, science of speed, contact Brady. Take care. Thank you guys again for joining us. Real quick, um, I wanted to first of all thank. Mr. Pete Butler for being here. You can see why he's our authority on all things indoor training. Um, also, kickers are on sale right now. Um, they are $8.99, so that's $300 off. If you get them before Thursday, you get an extra $100 off. So feel free to reach out for any questions about that as well. Have a great night.